What is something that you know about, but your mind just cannot fully comprehend it? Uh, what about the uh, things like a car? I mean, you get in a car every day, you drive it, but you don't necessarily know exactly how that internal combustion engine works. Or if you drive an electric car, you don't know how all the electrical components work. So there's some things that, uh, that you know about, but you just can't fully comprehend how it goes. Why is it that life is filled with daily decisions of faith? You see, there's that big word, faith. Stick around. We're going to look at John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, about how the Word became flesh and where our faith plays a part concerning that. Hey folks, welcome back to our Wednesday evening Bible study. If uh, you have your Bible, go ahead and turn with me, if you would, to uh, the book of John chapter 1. We're going to look at how the Word became flesh. Just a, a few moments ago, uh, I, was, I was talking to you a little bit about faith. And, of course, there's, there's this big uh, spiritual definition of faith, and faith being the substance of things hoped for, but the evidence of things not seen. Now, essentially what that means is that, that you believe in something even when you can't see it. Now, for a lot of people, that becomes a challenge. It becomes a challenge more so when we're talking about spiritual things. I don't believe that people are as challenged in their faith, uh, if, if you think about it from a worldly perspective, um, I, I talked to a fellow one time, and, and he said, I just really have a hard time believing in something that I can't see. And, and yet I used an example to help him understand that, that really that's not the case. Uh, and I'll use that example with you right now. We don't have any trouble walking over and looking outside the window and saying, man, it's windy outside today. Well, my question would be, can you actually see the wind? The answer to that is no, you can't see the wind. What you see is the results of the wind. You see the trees moving. You see the, the dust blowing across the road, or, uh, or, or you see uh, you know, the bushes and leaves moving or blowing around. So you don't actually see the wind. You see the results of the wind. You know, I, I've often said this as well. Uh, you know, when you come in and you sit down in a chair, do you pick the chair up and make sure that all the bolts are in place and that all the, the nuts are tightened down on it? No, you don't do that. You just go ahead and sit down. Now, there's probably been a time in your life before where you have been let down by that chair. All of a sudden, you found yourself on the floor for whatever reason, whether it broke or what have you. But it was, it was shocking. It was unexpected because you fully believed that chair was going to hold your weight. So most of us really have a little bit more trouble when it comes to uh, our faith concerning religious things or, or concerning spiritual things. Now today, uh, we're going to look at, uh, uh, at the book of John chapter 1, uh, beginning with verse 1, uh, which says this. It says, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Verse 4, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came uh, for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. Uh, he was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. Verse 9, that was the true light uh, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. Uh, he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the, the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory uh, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Let's pray together this evening. Our Father, as we come to you now, we do so uh, asking that your Holy Spirit would truly speak to our heart. Lord, we pray that uh, as we gather around your word, uh, we know that, that your word tells us where two or three are gathered uh, together, there you are in the midst. Uh, now, Lord, that could be uh, through whatever venue. Today, we come together around your word. Uh, Father, we ask that uh, the Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts to, to teach us what you need for us to know, what you desire for us to know 
about you and about who you are and about our walk with you. Lord, help us to, uh, to be able to concentrate and to focus upon you this day. May the distractions be minimal. And Lord, may you use your servant during this time to lift you up that you might draw all men unto you. So bless our time today, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, when we look at that, there's a, there's a whole lot that's going on uh, in these particular passages in John chapter 1. But, but, but in these passages today, John writes about the word that became flesh. Now, why do you think that John referred uh, to Jesus as the word? Now, you know, according to John, uh, where was Jesus before he was born? Let's look at verses 1 and 2 of our passage today. It says, in the beginning was the word. Now, notice it, it, it says, uh, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 2 says, he was, uh, he was in the beginning with God. So now, when we look at this particular passage, and, and it's making reference to Jesus. Now, some would say, well, how do we know that? Because if you look down, uh, particularly down uh, to verse 14, which we finished with, it says, and the Word became flesh. Uh, and we'll get to that in just a few moments, but how does the Word become flesh? Well, just to kind of put it out there for you right now, the Word became flesh through the incarnation. That's that fancy word meaning the birth of Christ. So the Word became flesh. That was the birth of Christ. So now if we go back up to verse 2, it says, He was, He being Jesus, uh, was uh, in the beginning with God. Now, folks, I, I know this is a hard concept for, for many to believe, but the Father is the Son, is the Holy Spirit. That's that thing we call the Trinity. Uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit. Okay, those have always existed since, you know, since God. Uh, they are as one. If you'll notice, too, you know, just some proofs of that, if you even go back into the, the book of Genesis and, and you begin to read about Adam and Eve and you begin to read about uh, what took place in the Garden of Eden, you will notice that, that there are times, particularly after uh, Adam and Eve's sin, where there is a, a plural that is used. And you know what plural means? It means more than one. Uh, and think about when God created man. It said, let us make man in our image. He didn't say, let me make man in my image. He says, us. There's that plurality. What does that plural equal? The three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we know that, uh, that, that Jesus the Son was with God in the beginning. Verse 2 tells us that. He was uh, in the beginning with God. So you know, when we begin to think about it in that light, you know, that helps us to understand some things as much as we can possibly understand. Now we also have to understand that, that, that our thinking is, is finite. It is not infinite. We have a really hard time being able to wrap our mind uh, around some of the things that we just have to believe by faith. People have often said, well, how do you explain the Trinity? I said, I explain it like this. The Father is the Son is the Holy Spirit. Uh, the three are one. Three personalities into one. And people say, I don't get it. And I love what a guy uh, did one day. He gave me a one of those, I call it the fidget spinner. Some of you have seen those. Maybe your kids have played with them. Uh, but it, it almost looks like a little triangle and it's got a uh, a ball bearing in the center and you can you can spin it and they just sit there it's a fidget spinner well if you spin that thing fast enough it's just like looking at a fan all you you, you can't see the individual blades of the fan but you see this one circular motion and I love what a guy said one day he said uh, I can explain uh, the Trinity like this and he held that fidget spinner up and he said here's the Father here's the Son here's the Holy Spirit and then he spun it so when it was spinning around it looked like one I thought what a great illustration to try to help our, our finite minds when it comes down uh, to trying to understand what is taking place uh, in that regard. See, folks, there's only one God, but they're in, in three different ways that they're manifest. That's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's the doctrine of the Trinity that, that, that we're talking about. Now, don't let fancy words mess up your thinking. I mean, when you can, eat, a lot of times we can sit there, we can look at things and, and we can say, man, this sounds really complicated. Uh, and, and we can make it harder than it really is. I love what it was that, that the Lord taught us uh, concerning uh, salvation and many other things. I love how he said this. He said that, that one must become like a child. You know, a child doesn't know all the ins and outs of everything, but a child is very trusting, a child is very accepting, and a child is very believing. If, if mom or dad says it, then, then that child pretty much takes it to heart. I've often used the illustration of, uh, 
uh, a child you know, jumping off of the, the, the side of the pool into his uh, father's arms and, and daddy's going, come on, jump. They don't think twice about it. They just go on and jump. They don't think about, well, the water's 12 feet deep here. They don't think about the fact that, you know, if, if I can't breathe underwater, I don't know how to swim. They don't let all the details keep them from being obedient, even when they don't understand. All they know is I'm going to jump off the side of the pool and daddy's going to catch me. Why? Because they trust daddy. Now, the question is, do we trust God in our lives, in every circumstance, in every situation? So don't let the fancy words uh, mess you up. You know, we just talked about the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I explained that to you with a fidget spinner, but if I were to sit here and say, today we're going to talk about the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, a lot of people would be going, oh, that's, that's above me. I'm not, I haven't been a Bible student. Uh, <clears throat> I don't have a, a formal biblical education, and it just makes it hard. Folks, don't make it hard. God never meant for his word to be so complicated, but I'll tell you what he did. He did intend for us to trust him by faith, with the things that we cannot fully comprehend. So we must accept the doctrine of the Trinity by faith simply because it's one of those things that, that nobody can explain. Now, I mean, even some of the greatest uh, preachers that you've ever known in your life will tell you that is just something that we, we, we don't know how to explain it. It's just the Father is the Son is the Holy Spirit, three personalities in one. Now, uh, John also tells us something about uh, Jesus' role in creation there in verse 3. In verse 3, he said, All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now, when we begin to think about creation, everything that, that, that you can read about in God's Word can trace back to the book of, of Genesis. All things were made through him. Yet we know some of the uh, right up front verses where it says that, uh, that God created man in his own image uh, and, and he breathed life into him. Now, for us, th that would be hard for us to comprehend today. I mean, you'd sit back and say, well, how could man do that? As far advanced as we are in technologies and, and everything else, how could this be possible? You know, people would sit back and say, well, genetic cloning and all these things. Well, no, no. It says that God made man from the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So, you know, when we consider that, you know, all of a sudden that becomes a different story. Well, okay, here's the raw material th that God had. We cannot fathom that. Uh, let's, let's take a look for just a moment. You don't have to turn there, but I'm going to look at uh, Colossians 1, uh, 15 uh, through 17 that says this. Colossians 1, 15 through 17 says, He is the image of the invisible God. Okay, this is Jesus. Uh, the, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And verse 17 says, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. So we see what part uh, uh, is played there when it comes down to, uh, to, to creation. It all traces back uh, to God, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit from the beginning of time. So again, don't let this be something that, 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 that sounds so complicated or that we allow to be so complicated in our lives that it stunts our spiritual growth. That's not what we want. Uh, see, there are ways uh, that, that Paul and John's words uh, are consistent concerning Jesus' role in creation because a lot of people sit back and say, well, you know, Jesus wasn't you know, part of the creation. Yes, he was. There are some verses that simply prove that. Uh, so let's look about what uh, John says uh, about Jesus' relationship to life and light as we consider verses 4 and 5 of John uh, chapter 1. John chapter 1, 4 and 5 says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now we're starting to, to see some, some different things along the way that, that are making references to, to Jesus in which, in which we know. Um, and I'll give you a few of those uh, examples here uh, in just a moment. Uh, just ask yourself, what, what do you think that he meant when he said this? Now, how is, is John using images of light and darkness to describe the life of Jesus? 
Now, when we begin to think about that, we know uh, that that Satan uh, essentially you know, came into the sin came into the world through uh, uh, Adam and Eve at the, at the Garden of Eden. That wasn't God's perfect plan. But we know that there was going to have to be a way made. Uh, for man to be able to make it through eternity after sin came into the world. Now, uh, one of the things I always like to mention is that when you go back to Genesis and you look at the, the, the situation in the Garden of Eden, uh, I mentioned a little while ago that, that there was a meeting that took place between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit after Adam and Eve partook of the forbidden fruit, uh, uh, the, the knowledge of good and evil that, uh, that they had acquired through partaking of that. And if you remember at that particular meeting, uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit said, now there's a, there's a tree in the garden that they cannot partake of, and that is the tree of life. If you remember, it says that, that, that God posted a, an angel with a flaming sword uh, so that Adam and Eve did not partake of the tree of life. Prior to their uh, partaking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they could have taken uh, from the tree of life. Because remember, it says, of any tree of the garden, we can freely eat with the exception of this one. And that one they were talking about was the knowledge of good and evil, the one they partook of. So they could have eaten from the tree of life. Had they done that, what would that have meant? That would have meant that they would have had mortality. And of course, they, they did at that point. That would have meant all of mankind uh, would have been immortal rather than, uh, uh, than being mortal. In other words, man wouldn't, wouldn't die if they took a bat. Well, why is that so significant? Why is that so important? The reason that it's so important is that if man didn't die, there would not be a, a way uh, in which uh, he could be redeemed. You know, the Bible tells us, it says, um, that when it comes down to, to life and death, it says, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, uh, the judgment. So, you know, these are some things that, that, that we need to consider along the way. Man would have lived, uh, you know, with immortality in his sin. There, there wouldn't have been a way for his redemption. There wouldn't have been a way for uh, us to be in that place that God uh, has created for us. So you know, death entered essentially at the Garden of Eden uh, when Adam and Eve sinned. Uh, so when you consider all these things, you know, how does John use the image of light and darkness to describe the life of Jesus? You know, we, we always kind of have representation of light and darkness. When we think about uh, darkness, we think about things that are evil. We think about things that are bad. How many times have maybe you heard or said, well, that person was in a very dark place. Uh, we, we see that as, as not a good place. We see darkness as uh, the time when the criminals come out, when uh, the things that people don't want to be seen, including themselves, take place. Whereas lightness is, is uh, the thing that we look at as the goodness. That's what you want. In the middle of pitch black, you want darkness because light helps you to be able to see. So you can see that comparison and contrast between light and dark concerning Jesus. So it is significant that darkness cannot overcome light. And uh, how many times uh, have we read throughout the scripture that, that Jesus is, is the light as well as the life? the light to shine in the midst of the darkness, the light to, to point out the sin, to be able to forgive the sin. The Lord is our light, and he is not only our light, but he is also our life. Now, uh, verses 6 through 8, uh, we begin to hear about uh, John the Baptist. Uh, look, at, uh, look, at, look with me, if you would, at verses uh, 6 through 8. It says, it says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This, uh, this man came for a witness to bear witness of the light. Did you get that? Of the light, being Jesus Christ, that all through him might believe. He was not the light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. Now, we've often talked about this. I think we mentioned it uh, maybe even last week that John the Baptist was uh, called the forerunner of Christ. He was the one who was out, who was preaching repentance. He was saying that there is one who is coming that, uh, that, that will be able uh, to redeem you from your sins. And, and he was referring to the light. This particular passage is, is calling Jesus the light. Uh, his role was extremely important this, in the same way that your role and my role is, is important. 
Remember that as we've gone through these Bible studies, one of the things that I've asked you to do is to look for examples to follow in what you see in God's Word. Here is a tremendous example for us to be able to follow. So when we think about, yeah, what's an example we can follow? We can be like John the Baptist. We can be the forerunners of Christ in a lost and dying world, in a dark world in which we live. Now, when I say a dark world, I'm, I'm mainly talking about those who do not have uh, the Lord as, as Savior of their life. Uh, any place where evil is, there is darkness, and we are to be light bearers. The Word of God tells us that. We are to bear that light. We are to be uh, the witnesses for our Lord and Savior, as the Word has told us, as John did. We must go out and preach repentance as well. What a tremendous example for us to follow would be to follow in the shoes of a John the Baptist. Now, notice what it says. It says John is not the Savior. He was preaching of the Savior, but he was the one whom we call and consider the forerunner of Christ. Now, when, when the true light came in, in, into the world uh, that he had made, yeah, how did the world respond to Jesus? You know, we're talking about, remember, the light is Jesus. Verses 9 and 10 tell us how the world responded to him when he came into this world. Uh, verse 9 says this. It says uh, that that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. Uh, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. Now, catch verse 11. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Now, when we talk about him coming to his own, that is talking about uh, the Jewish people. That is talking about the, the, you know, the people of Israel. And you know, of, of all the people who should have known and seen Jesus, it should have been them. We talk a lot uh, in, uh, in, in our Bible studies, because we read about them in, in God's Word, about the Pharisees. The Pharisees were that group of people uh, who were biblical scholars. I guess you would say they were the most spiritually educated of the day. They had all the answers. If you really look through the Scriptures, you will find that when the Pharisees were consulted, they had the right answers in so many places. Um, even when you think about uh, when, when Christ was born, when the, the Magi went and, and actually consulted of, of Herod about, you know, who is this newborn king? Who is this Jesus? Where is he to be born? Uh, and and they, he consulted his wise men. His wise men told him seven miles down the road, you know, he'll you know, be born in, in Jerusalem. They knew all of the, the information of the Bible, but it hadn't reached their heart yet. You know, when, when you think about that, when the light came into the world, it said that his own received him not. They knew that there was going to be a coming Messiah. In fact, there are a lot of Jews today who still maintain that Jesus has not come yet, and they're still looking for him, just like the Pharisees uh, that we read about in the days of the, the Old as well as the New Testament, and particularly that time around the birth of Christ. Yeah, they're still looking for him. Now, if anybody should have known that Jesus that had, had arrived, it should have been them because they had all of the biblical answers, and yet they didn't receive him. His own people, the Jewish people, responded to him in rejection. There's also other scriptures that, that, that refer to that. It talks about how Jesus was the chief cornerstone, and the, the, the cornerstone, the stone the builders rejected was the one. Uh, that they had long awaited for, the one that they, they should have seen, the one that they should have known, and then thus salvation being made uh, available to the Gentile people. Now, I want to approach one thing, uh, one question, because I've been asked this many, you know, many times throughout my uh, almost 30 years of ministry, and people have said this. They said, well, what if the Jews uh, and the Jewish people would have accepted Christ? Would that mean that all the Gentile people would never have had an opportunity for salvation. I don't believe that statement to be true. Now, let me let me put something in perspective here as well. People have said, well, who are the Gentile people? Here's a real easy explanation. If you are not Jewish, then you're a Gentile. That's, that's real simple, isn't it? If you're not Jewish, <clears throat> then you're a Gentile. So, when we think about that and people say, well, if the, if the Jews would have accepted him during that day, did that mean that salvation wouldn't be made available to the Gentile people? Me, you, and most people that are watching this. 
I believe the answer to that question is no, because I believe that the way God had it designed was that the, the Jewish people would have been his best representatives uh, had they come to know him. They would have been the ones who would have carried the gospel forward to the Gentile people. Uh, so I don't believe that, it, that, that Gentiles simply have an opportunity for salvation because the Jews didn't receive him. I think that God's ultimate plan was that, that had the Jewish people trusted him and believed in him like they should, they should have been the greatest evangelical arm that the world ever knew and would reach out to the Gentile people. Uh, because I don't think God changes his mind uh, in his plans. Now, I know that some would argue and would say there are places where it says, and God changed his mind. That's a different message uh, for a different day. But I believe that, that, that God's plan, uh, it, just as it says in the word, is that, that, that he would that none should perish. I don't believe that he wants anybody to spend an eternity in hell. Now, we'll get into that uh, maybe at, uh, at, at one of our other Bible studies, but I believe that had the Jews accepted him, they would have been the greatest evangelical arm that the world had ever known, even probably up to this day, uh, yet they didn't. It says uh, in, in verses 9 and 10 of the passage we're looking at today that, that, that the people rejected him. Yeah, how could this happen, man? How, how could something so tragic happen and take place like that? Well, too many times we get so uh, caught up in ourselves and we think we know so much that we can't see the forest for the trees. But you know, along this, uh, the lines in these passages, there's an incredible gift that Jesus gives to all who receive him uh, as we read in verse 12. Verse 12 says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the, the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Man, he gives us the right to be called his children. Now, what does it mean to be a child of God? What does it mean to be born again? Uh, often we will use those statements, and, and I think that, uh, that sometimes we're guilty of using uh, so much church terminology. And folks, let me tell you, there's a lot of people who didn't have the, the blessings that maybe you and I had. If you had the opportunity to be raised uh, uh, in church, maybe within, in a Christian home, there are a lot of folks that didn't have that opportunity. and They don't know all this terminology. Uh, one that's, uh, that's kind of ironic, and you may have heard me mention it um, this past week, was uh, I still remember a fellow who didn't have an opportunity to be uh, raised in, in a Christian uh, home, family, and church, and, and we were talking uh, back 20 years ago about having homecoming at church, and he had lunch with my family and I, and when we were sitting there, he said, uh, What's homecoming? He said, you know, when I think about homecoming, I think about a football game and you crown a queen and all these type things. So sometimes we're guilty of using church terminology, and one of those church terminologies is born again. What does it mean to be born of God? The Word of God tells us that uh, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, when he approached that situation with his disciples, his disciples didn't understand it, and they said, well, Lord, we don't understand. How can a a person re-enter his mother's womb and be born, and Jesus began to explain that he wasn't talking about a physical rebirth, but he was talking about a spiritual rebirth. When you trust the Lord, when you give your life over to him, when you say, Lord, I realize that I am a sinner. I realize, Father, that, that I need you as my Savior. I realize that you paid the price through your death, your burial, and your resurrection. And Lord, I'm no longer me. I'm turning my life over to you. Uh, and you mean that with all your heart. That doesn't mean that it was something, a process that you did at church or a prayer that you prayed or you checked the box on a card and sent it in. It means that with all of your heart, you want to begin that relationship with, with, with our Father in heaven, that we might be able to call, uh, call him Father and that we might be truly brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what it means to be born again. Not a, a physical rebirth, but a spiritual birth. And he gives us that right and that opportunity. That's why when we bow our head, we say, our father, because he is my father, my spiritual father. That's why uh, in church, you've heard people call each other brother before. Well, hey, brother Don, brother Tim, brother Blake. Because spiritually, we are brothers. We're part of the same family. And man, what a, what a great, great thought that is. There was no greater uh, example and illustration that the Lord gives us than that of family. The relationship between 
fathers and sons and the relationships between each other. What a, what a blessed uh, experience he gives us and the way he relates it in that regard. Uh, <laughs> so what does it mean to be a child of God? What does it mean to be born again? Have you given your life to our Father? Have you, have, has there been that time? Now, I mentioned a moment ago, have you done that? It's not just about what, what this is and what this says. It's not about having a head knowledge unless what you know trickles down to your heart. Have you ever said, Lord, you know, by the way, prayer is just a way of communicating with God. Have you ever been able to say, Lord, I realize today that I'm a sinner uh, and, and I'm going to die and go to hell without you. So, Lord, I'm, I'm giving my life to you. I'm giving over everything I am to you. Come into my life and save my soul. Help me, Lord, to live for you. See, have you done that? You know, it's interesting, too, that, that a lot of times you know, people will, will, will take that, that, that opportunity and they'll say, okay, I've done that, now I'm saved. But, but the Bible goes on and tells us that not all who say, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he goes on, he says, but those who do the will of the Father. Now, that doesn't mean that we're saved by works. The Bible clearly states that. Uh, but what it does say is that Jesus in you should change you. Is there a change in your life? Do you now have the Holy Spirit who convicts you when, when, of your wrongdoings, things that, that are uh, against what God wants us to be doing in his word? Uh, do, do you now have the Holy Spirit communicating with you? There is evidence. That is evidence in your life of salvation in your life. Yeah, you know, I've had people many times that have come and said to me, they're like, you know, I've done this all my life, but for some odd reason now, I, I don't feel right about doing it. Why is that? And usually I just grin real big because I'll say, that's the Holy Spirit convicting your heart that this is not something that is pleasing to God. What a great evidence of Jesus in your life, and that is the Holy Spirit uh, convicting your life of those wrongdoings. Think about it. Now, it says that the Word became flesh. What does that mean? Verse 14 says, the Word became flesh. What that means is that the Word, when we looked at this, remember the Father is the Son, is the Holy Spirit. They've always been from the beginning of time. It says in the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. Okay, It says the Word became flesh. How does the Word become flesh? That was the birth of Jesus Christ. That, the, the big fancy church word we use for that is the incarnation. That was when he was born. When Jesus walked this earth as a physical man, he was 100% man, but he was also 100% God. He never, ever laid down his deity to, to become the sin sacrifice for us. See, if he had done that, then the price wouldn't have been paid. He was the perfect once for one and all sacrifice. So he was crucified. He took all of our sins, past, present, and future, to the cross. He was buried in that barred tomb. For three days. On the third day, he arose and he conquered sin. He conquered death because he was able to do that being the perfect sacrifice. So it says the word became flesh. That means that Jesus uh, walked this earth. That means that, that, that the word was born. Okay. Uh, so when the, the, the world sees uh, that the, the, the word became flesh, look with me uh, at, at verse 14 if you would. Verse 14 says, yeah, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That was Jesus. And we beheld his glory, the glory uh, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, there are people, there are eyewitness accounts of people who walked with Jesus. Uh, I've said this many times. What is the difference between uh, Jesus and Muhammad or all these other gods? Well, you can go to the grave of all the other uh supposed prophets and, and, and saviors, and what you'll find is their bones. If you go to the grave of Jesus Christ, you'll still find bones, but you won't find his. You'll find Joseph of Arimathea's. A little trivia for you. Remember that? See, the borrowed tomb was borrowed from Joseph of Arimathea. Jesus only needed it for three days. So after the third day, it became Joseph of Arimathea's tomb again. That's who you'll find there, because you won't find the bones of, of, of my Savior Jesus Christ there. It just won't happen because he's risen. He has ascended back to the right hand of the Father. He has prepared a place for you and I, for those who know him, for those who love him, a place where we can spend all of eternity with him. You know, the word became flesh and dwelt among men. Yeah, when did you receive Jesus Christ and believe in his name? I want you to think back to that uh, for just a few moments. What was that experience like? Now, 
I, I know a lot of folks, there, there are some that can sit there and tell me, well, I know the day, the date, the time, uh, who, was, uh, who the preacher was or who the person that led me to the Lord was. Um, folks, that is great because that meant that there was such a mark and a change in your life at that particular point that that, that was a moment in your life you'll always remember. Now, I can remember the moment in my life, and I can't tell you the day, date, or time because I was very young. I think I was around five or six years old, but I can still picture it in my mind like, like it was yesterday because what a great experience uh, that was. Think about that time that you received and you believed in Jesus' name. I hope and pray that you can actually remember that. I hope that you're not sitting there going, well, I, I've gone to church a lot. I've gone to church all my life, or I did this at a camp because all my friends were, or whatever the situation may be. Can you remember the time and mark that time when you invited Jesus into your life, when you received him? Now, if you can, let me ask you this question. How have you been different since becoming a child of God? I gave you an example a moment ago of uh, times when people will come and they'll ask me and they'll say, I just don't understand what's, what's taking place and what's going on here. And I'm, I'm saying, you have all the great signs of salvation in your life, the leadership of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's guidance in your life. What a blessing that really is. But how have you been different since you became a child of God? Is, is your thought process different? Are your actions different? They should be. Because like I said before, I'll say it again, and I will say it as long as God gives me breath. Jesus in your life changes your life, and it changes it for the better. It's not something that you have to seek. The Holy Spirit will be your teacher and your guide. Your, your guide. You, I mean, you can't help but learn from him. So in what ways do you share Jesus with other people? You know, we talked about John the Baptist. You know, it's really easy for me to say because God called me to preach. You're, you're listening here. Here's how I share Jesus with people. I, you know, people have that expectation. That's what preachers do. How do you share Jesus with people, being in your job, being in your office, being in your school, wherever it may be? How is it that you share what Jesus has done? Now, here's the great part about it. I've I've said this, a witness. You know, we, we always talk about that in the church. We need to be a witness for him. Well, what does a witness mean? What does a witness do? A witness is somebody who testifies to something that they have personally seen. You can't testify to something somebody else has seen. In a court of law, they call that hearsay. I can only testify to the things I personally saw and that I personally have heard. Yeah, isn't that what Jesus told us? He says, uh, when his disciples said this, we cannot help but testify about the things that we have seen and what we have heard. What have you seen and heard God do in your life? That should make you excited to be able to share those with other people. Now, some of you sat back and said, well, I'm a believer, but I haven't just really seen or heard anything that he's doing in my life. It is time for you to come home. It is time for you to come back into a right fellowship with Christ. That doesn't mean you lost your salvation, but you can break fellowship with him, just like the prodigal son. The prodigal son, when he went off into a far land, it says when he came to himself, he returned home, and there was the father waiting on him. Not only waiting on him, he ran out to greet him. That is what the Lord wants to do for you today. If you find yourself in the hog pen of life needing to head home, I'm encouraging you right now, get up and head in the direction of the Father because he wants you in his arms, not in that wayward country. What do we need to do today and as we go in the future? Let us pray that the, the grace and the truth of Jesus Christ will continue to transform our lives and that we will share him with others. You know, when we do that, sometimes we just have to believe things by faith. Sometimes we just have to believe that the Lord is who he says he is. He's going to do what he says he's going to do, not because we have the proof of it, but because he says that we're going to walk in faith. What does it say about salvation? We are, salvation in and of itself says we're saved by grace through faith, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Saved by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Listen, I hope and trust and pray that, first of all, Jesus has transformed your life through salvation, and secondly, that you're walking with him. And even the things that you don't understand, that you're going to be able to be like that child at the pool. When daddy says, jump to me, you just go ahead and jump because you know the Father is going to catch you. Let me go ahead and give you our scripture readings for next week before I 
uh, send us off in a word of prayer. But next week, we're actually going to be looking at the book of John chapter 3 through John chapter 7. Remember, one chapter a day. And I want you to read ahead. I want you to just concentrate on that one chapter a day and let the Lord speak to you. This week, starting today, John chapter 3 through John chapter 7. Next week, we're actually going to be looking at the, the, the passages out of John's Gospel, chapter 5, verses 2 through 17, and that's going to be dealing with the, the healing uh, at the pool of Bethesda. One of the great, great stories. I love this. One of my favorite uh, biblical passages, okay? So uh, just kind of spend a little extra time and study in John 5, 2 through 17. That's what we'll be dealing with next week. Just as a couple of reminders, uh, we do have uh, some of our uh, on-campus Sunday school classes that are meeting here. Kelly Joyce uh, is meeting in the sanctuary during Sunday school time. His class is being done in person as well as a hybrid class. So if uh, you're still not getting back out in public yet, you can join Kelly's class uh, by way of the, uh, the computer link, and I believe he uses WebEx. If you need that, contact the church. We'll get you in touch with Kelly, and we'll make sure you can be a part of that. Mike Nelson, uh, his Sunday school class is also meeting on the second story of the educational building back in the corner. For those people that are around here, we always call that Rogers classroom uh, back in the corner, but that's where they're meeting. I believe Mike is also doing a hybrid class. Uh, so you can either join them in person or you could join them uh, by way of, I believe they're doing Zoom, uh, Zoom meetings uh, with their Sunday school class as well. Uh, also, our youth Sunday school class is meeting in the youth room uh, on Sunday mornings. We're looking to start bringing some things back online. We don't really want to do that as we head into the summer yet, just simply because we've got a lot of people that are going to be traveling. You didn't get to go last year. There are going to be a lot of people on vacation. But keep us in your prayers. Uh, as we look to uh, re-enter what would be considered a new normal, not because of who we are, but because of what God wants for us. We want to do things God's way uh, as we turn this corner and as we head into the future. Uh, <clears throat> don't forget, uh, maintain your, your tithe and offering. It's very important for your spiritual uh, blessings as well as the blessings of our church. Multiple ways to be able to do that. Uh, if you're here, you can drop it in one of our uh, offering boxes uh, on Sunday. Uh, if you're not, if you're watching this online, you can go to our website. You'll see it here on the screen, www.oakridgecbc.org. There's a giving tab there. You can give that way. Uh, you can mail it, good old uh, snail mail at P.O. Box 533, Oak Ridge, North Carolina, 27310. Or if you just happen to be in the area during the week, you can drop it by during office hours and we'll make sure it gets in the, in the right place. God has blessed our church uh, tremendously through the, the time of the, the pandemic. And I know that he's blessed each and every one of you that have remained faithful in your giving. And the ministry continues on from Central Baptist Church. So uh, don't forget uh, uh, to maintain that time and offering that God may continue to bless you. All right, let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer. And uh, we'll be looking forward to seeing you here on Sunday. Father, we thank you again for, uh, Lord, for Jesus. We thank you for the fact that uh, uh, you provided a way of salvation that we truly might have the opportunity to be in your presence uh, forever and ever and ever, which is something we cannot comprehend, we cannot wrap our mind around. Lord, I know that there are a lot of things that are complex for us, some things that we cannot fully understand. But Lord, help us to trust you by faith. Help us to trust your word uh, by faith as we go forward. And Lord, I don't mean just that guessing at it, but I mean solid, firm faith that we're putting our life and our trust in you and in your word. Lord, I pray that you will work on uh, each and every one of our lives, that you may shine forth, that others may truly see you. Father, I pray that if there's one that doesn't know you, that today truly would be the day that they would surrender to you. Lord, I pray that, uh, that they will uh, contact us and let us help them in their spiritual journey, in their spiritual walk. Thank you, Father, for those that have taken the time to join us by way of this broadcast. May you bless them and their family in a very special way as we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, folks, one other thing I just want to mention. Uh, if, if there's anything we can help you with, if you trusted Christ, if you need some help in your walk, if you need some material, we would love to, to, to walk that journey with you. Contact us through the website. Give us a call at the church. We would love to, to meet with you and help you along the way of your spiritual journey because that's what God put us here for. We're here to celebrate with, with you. God bless you. We're looking forward to being together once again on Sunday around his work.